It is amazing that we are all still here today, that we have actually made it to this point where we are sitting in the pews today. Because I know when I was little, there were plenty of things that could have just taken me out of the world very early on. I remember a day when a friend of mine were actually over at our house. We were playing with toys. I had my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles out. We were all just having a good time, and we loaded those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles up into the party wagon, and we stuck them in the time machine. The only problem was that the time machine was the microwave, and I set it on high for 10 minutes, and the sparks coming off of those metal axles were just amazing. It was, it was a glorious sight to behold. And my mom came in just at the right moment to be able to turn that thing off before we all perished. (laughs) We know how much with our little ones we have this, this fear, especially as we know more, as we hear about more reports and stories all the time on the news about the dangers that befall our little ones. You know, it might be tempting just to sort of wrap them up in bubble wrap and just keep them from harm But then you'd have to remember that bubble wrap is probably a choking hazard. So even that is probably not a good idea. But wouldn't it be nice if we could just cocoon our little ones away from the world, keeping them innocent for as absolutely long as possible? And I know we pray about that. We certainly do ask God to watch over our little ones, to care for them, and to to really just take care of them and keep them from evil. And it does, in fact, remind me of Jesus' great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. John 17, Jesus, as we mentioned in one of the last parenting lessons that we were doing, Jesus wasn't a father, but with his disciples, he had a very fatherly way about him. He he cared about them as someone who was watching over them and responsible for them. And in John 17, as he's preparing to leave, As he's preparing to go, he prays to the Father that, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I'm not asking that you remove them from the world, that you hide them away from the world, Jesus says, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus has some great words here about his disciples in this great high priestly prayer. And we know that he is about to send them out into the world. We know what's about to happen to Jesus. He's not going to be around anymore in the ways that he has been around for his disciples in the past. And he is now asking God not to take them out of the world. I love I love the way that Jesus prays here. Have you ever prayed for something that you don't want to happen? Or have you ever clarified what you're not asking for in a prayer to God? I'm not asking for this, but God, for you to do that instead. Notice here, it is sort of the natural response that anyone might have. And that's why I think Jesus says, I'm not asking for you to take them out of the world. Think about it as parents, as we were just talking about. Wouldn't it be nice to take our kids out of the world? I think it's our natural response. When you see the dangers going on out, outside, when you see all the terrible things that this world practices and participates in, wouldn't it just make sense for us all to hole ourselves up into a commune somewhere and just isolate ourselves from the world? And Jesus says, that may be what everyone's thinking right now, but that's not what I'm praying for. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one as I send them out. And that really is, as parents, where we're going to continue and sort of close this series that I've been doing here on training wheels. At some point, you have to take the training wheels off the bike, and you have to send them out on their own. You cannot be there anymore. You cannot be the helicopter parent, or as some some people have now been calling it, lawnmower parenting. I don't know if you've heard that term. Maybe if you're in a colder climate, maybe snowblower parenting, where effectively you as the parent go before them and blaze a trail, clearing out all the obstacles so that they never have to face anything challenging. We can't be that way. 
for all of our kids' lives. That's not going to work. Jesus was not going to be with his disciples throughout all of their lives, and we cannot be with our children throughout their entire lives. The design is that eventually we do send them out, and that's why we're preparing them for a life of service to God. And so in this series, we've talked in the very beginning from Proverbs 22, verse 6, how we train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It kind of encapsulates what we've talked about, about laying a stable foundation for our kids in our homes, how we shepherd and shape them through our guidance and through our, our rules and our integrity and our follow-through. And now we're going to talk this morning about sending them out. How do we send them out into the world? And again, you will probably rightly say, well, Brian, you've never had to send out a child, so how can you teach us about sending out a child? Well, neither did Paul, neither did Jesus, and when I can go and look to the writings of Paul and Jesus and a lot of other inspired writers, particularly God, the perfect father himself, I can see God's pattern for the home and God's instruction for parents. And so that's what we're going to share today, just a few things from God's word. And the big lesson, the big idea here in this lesson is though our role in our children's lives will change, it absolutely will change. You will not be the kind of parent you were when your kids were babies, as you are when your kids are teenagers, as you are when your kids leave the house. But our role changes. But while that role changes, we are still uniquely qualified to guide them, to direct them, and to encourage them once they've left the house. There is never going to be anyone in your child's life like mom or dad. No one. No one will ever fill that role for them. You will always have that responsibility. You may not be able to ground them. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? If you could ground your adult children, maybe you need to sometimes. But you may never be able to do that, but you certainly will be able to continue to guide them and continue to direct them and continue to encourage them along the way. And you, as their parent, are uniquely qualified to do that. And so that's the big idea here in this lesson. And we all have an opportunity in this first point that I want to draw out. We have an opportunity to guide our kids through trouble. You ever watch that show Mythbusters? Mythbusters was where they basically go and they find some question or some premise and they, they want to prove it out. They want to test it out. And so they, they rig up all these experiments and stuff. One of the hosts of that show says, failure is always an option. I know sometimes we think failure is not an option, but you know, failure is always an option. When your kids are getting up and they're, they're first learning to walk, you know how often they failed at doing that, right? You've seen them fall flat on their bottom multiple times when they were trying to learn to walk. And it's not going to be surprising to us as parents when our kids leave the house and they're going to fail. It's, it should not be surprising to us because any time we get out there and do something new. Anytime we take new steps in a, in a positive direction, failure is always an option. And so we as parents need to be ready to guide them through that trouble. And so the idea here is that we can't protect our children from every danger in the world. Again, like that bubble wrap idea. We can't cover them in bubble wrap. We can't helicopter over them. We're not going to lawnmower in front of them all the time throughout their whole lives but we will be there and, and ready to guide them through trouble. And so while we can't protect them from every danger in the world, we need to be there to support them and to welcome them home. I think it's so important for us to see how Jesus points us to this great example about God's welcoming and God's support over us in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, of course, you'll know this is the great prodigal son. And here in this story about lost things in Luke chapter 15, this is the last real major story here in this chapter about something that was lost. And notice here the father who is, has watched his child go and, and wastefully just spent all of his inheritance. And he's living this, this wasteful, prodigal lifestyle. And finally, when, when the kid hits rock bottom, he's eating with the pigs. He's eating in the pig's trough. Finally, in his mind, he says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He has a light bulb moment there in the trough, and he remembers that, that my father has taken care of all of his servants, 
And so I'm just going to go back and beg, beg my father to become one of his servants again so that I could finally have something to eat because I'm, I'm just at rock bottom now. And so as he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father was on the horizon the whole time, waiting and watching. And of course, we know this story here is about God, the perfect father who watches over those who would come back. And we really know that the main story here is about the other son who is unwilling to welcome the brother back. And that's really the the focus of this story. But notice here how God welcomes us back when we fall. He welcomes us back. He supports us when we fall. He's there, ready and willing to, to accept us back when we humbly come back and acknowledge what we've done. We need to be there to support and welcome back our kids too. And notice in that story, and I think this is so powerful, the father doesn't go do anything, right? The father doesn't go run out after the son. The father doesn't go send messengers out after the son. The father sits and waits. Are you a patient person? Patience is so hard especially for those of us who just want something done and we want it done right now. And especially with our kids, as our kids have grown up, we have demanded that they do the right thing and do the right thing now. But when they leave the house, there's going to be a transition from our demanding the right thing be done now to our our patiently waiting for them to come to their own senses, for them to come, come and realize their sins and come back to us. Notice what the father did do, though. The father in that story laid the foundation for his son to remember back when I was with my father, he took care of me. He did everything he could up to the very moment where that son left the house. And then at that moment, it was up to the son to come to the realization to turn back and remember how good dad has been. And we need to be that way with our kids. We need to lay the foundation showing them exactly who we are, what we're all about, and how loving and compassionate and supportive we are so that when they do leave the house, if they should find themselves in the pigsty, that they'll come to their senses and remember, what did dad used to tell me? What did mom used to tell me? How how did they treat people? How did they live their lives? And maybe that light bulb moment goes off for them and they decide to come back home. But we need to be there, of course, to support them and welcome them back home when they make that decision. And we need to be praying for them. I mean, the most important thing we certainly can be doing is praying for them. Like Job prayed for his children there in Job chapter 1, verse 5, before all the the bad stuff started to happen, Job was constantly sacrificing for his, his children. He was constantly pleading with the Lord to forgive them if if by chance they did something wrong. So no, we may not be in our helicopter over our children when they're 45 years old, but we certainly can be praying to the Father for them. And as as we look there in John chapter 17, as Jesus in this great high priestly prayer, we know that Jesus wasn't going to be in the lives of his disciples all the time. But he knew that God would be with them. And he prayed that God would be with them. And that's what we can continue to pray for our kids. When they leave the house, we may not be there to do everything for them, support them in every possible way, but we have a, we have a great high priest and we have a great father who will watch over them and care for them when we can't. And we need to remember that. We need to remember the power that we have to pray for them and to keep them in our, in our concern. Keep their name before the Father. And so, how are you going to respond when your child fails their tests? I know it's not easy to think about. You know, our kids right now, especially when they're younger, they, everybody gets a participation trophy. You know, everybody sort, of, everybody sort of gets an extra credit opportunity to kind of make up some, some mistakes that you made on, on homework or whatever. We give our kids a lot of leeway right now. And when they leave the house, Failure is an option, and I know that's scary. I'm terrified about that, honestly, for myself. We really do have to understand, though, that that 
if that moment comes, how are we going to respond? Decide ahead of time. Maybe sit down with your, with your spouse and have a conversation about how are we going to handle if, if we have our own prodigal moments? What are we going to do when those prodigal moments happen to our family, happen to our children? How are we going to respond to that? Maybe make a plan. Maybe talk through these things before those moments ever happen. And, and if they never happen, well, great. My prayer is for all of us that those would never happen. But when they do, if they do, be ready for those things and, and know how you're going to respond ahead of time. Because we, as parents, no matter how old our kids are, can always be there to guide them through their troubles. So that's the first point. Let's move on to the second point here. We, can, we have an opportunity as parents to provide them a lasting direction. You know, if you think about there from Proverbs 22, verse 6, the whole point of that proverb Train up the child in the way that he'll go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. You have pointed them in a direction. You know, like those little toys that you, you kind of pull back on the table and then they, they kind of crank up. Brenna, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You let that thing go and it just shoots off in the direction. That's kind of what we do as parents. You know, we hold them, we care about them, we pull them back, we give them all the momentum and point them in the right direction and there they go. And then it's up to them. But that lasting direction, we have, the, we have the control over that when we're in their lives, when they're still in our homes. And so we need to remember that God made our kids for his glory and not ours. Our kids' lives should not be about making sure that mom and dad look good out in public, but making sure that they are connected to the Lord God. That's what our kids' lives should be about. And if you think about the purpose of your parenting, it should be to constantly reinforce that it's about God. This is not about me. This is not about my wife. This is not about our family. This is about God. And we need to constantly be instilling that information into our kids' heads as they're still in our house. Instill in them an identity of a servant. They need to know that they are a servant that they can be a servant to the Lord God. And, and no better, I think, would, uh, would, would our time be spent than to look at Hannah. I love Hannah's story, how Hannah, she wanted a child so badly, and she was just distraught over the fact that she couldn't have a child. And so finally, the Lord gave her a child. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, as she fulfills her promise by bringing Samuel into the Lord's service after he was weaned, sort of letting go of Samuel's hand and giving Samuel over to Eli for Eli to watch after him. She says, for this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. That's what we need to do with our kids. We need to lend them to the Lord. And notice what she says here. Samuel at this moment was, was a very young boy. And no doubt Hannah had no idea how important Samuel was going to be in the service of God. But she says, as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. Now, does Samuel have any say in that? Well, of course he does. Samuel could have chosen not to be lent to the Lord. Samuel could have at some point in his life chosen to leave God. Certainly that was the case. But from, from his mother's perspective and his father's perspective, he's lent to the Lord. This is, where I, this is my motivation as a parent, is to give my children over to the Lord as his servants. And that's what my focus should be on. Like Hannah's focus was on giving our kids to the Lord, lending them to the Lord. And, and I think if we remember that, if we remember what this whole thing is about, what our purpose is, why we're even parents at all, is to raise up another generation who loves and serves God, I think that changes the game for us. It kind of takes us out of the, the rat race and the monotony of soccer practice and, and piano recitals and, and you know, tests and standardized testing and all the school things that are happening, and it helps us elevate ourselves to see this is not about those things. This is not about glorifying me or my family. This, this is about the Lord God. And so remembering that we are raising up another generation to serve God, and I think it's so important for us to get them connected to the vine. 
get them connected to the vine. That, it, it's not about me. I'm just another branch in the vine. I'm just another branch connected to the vine, and I want them to be a branch connected to the vine as well. I want them to find their purpose. I want them to find what their role in the body is. In John chapter 15, as Jesus says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If that's true for me, if that's true for you, then that is absolutely true for your children as well. Your children are never going to grow up to be the president of the United States or to be some amazing, successful person someday and have that be the most important accomplishment of their lives. The most important accomplishment of their lives will be then that they are connected to the vine. The most important thing that they can ever be and to ever do is for them to be a servant of the king. And unless they're that, they're nothing, as Jesus says. If that's true for you and me, that's true for our children too. And so remember that life as a parent and, and leading our little ones, what direction are we sending them off into? Well, it better be sending them into the service of God. It better be to, to lend them to the Lord. And so do you see yourself more as a steward as you're preparing your kids for life without you? I think when you realize that you're a steward of your kids, it really changes the game, again, about, about how you see your role as a parent. This is not my child. It is my child, right? Ashlyn is my child. But I want her to be the Lord's child. I want her to be God's child. And as I think about that, as I'm a steward, it's, no, it's not about me. It's not about how great a parent I am or if I'm going to receive some amazing parenting of the year award or whatever. It's about letting her develop that relationship with God. And how best can I do that? How can I continue to reinforce that for her? Well, get her connected. Help her find her role as a servant. Maybe sit down and, and, and see. You know, we ask our kids a lot. What do you want to be when you grow up? When I was a kid, I actually said I wanted to be a football. Not a football player. I, I used to tell my mom I wanted to be a football. I'm like, you know how silly our kids are, and you know how silly you used to be. And we ask our kids silly questions like that all the time, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe ask them this question. How do you want to serve the Lord when you grow up? Because while our vocations are important, while our jobs are important, someday we're going to retire if we're allowed to live, live long enough. Someday we're going to retire and we're no longer going to be defined by that job that we always had. But as a servant of the Lord, we're never going to retire from that. Or we should not. In our role in the body, what, what way are you going to serve? What function are you going to have? What function are your little ones going to have someday? How can they develop those skills now to become someone who is integral in the, the workings of the body of Christ? And so we give them lasting direction. Finally here, I think as parents, as we send our kids out into the world, you know, we could end this thing sort of on a Debbie Downer moment where we're having like a, a view of our kids as like this is doom and gloom. Hope, you know, what if they never come to the Lord? But, but just stop for a second. Stop and remember that when our kids do obey, when our kids do follow the Lord, when they do get connected to the vine, I mean, how happy are you going to be as a parent to know that your little ones are now a brother or a sister in Christ? What a, what a gift that's going to be someday when your son or your daughter becomes a brother or sister. You know, it's not, it's not that they're my children now, now they're my brother. Now they're my sister. And that's a, some of you have been through that moment. And some of you can, I, you know, you sort of, I can see it within you now. You're like welling up with pride and, and just joy over the fact that your kids are obedient. And, and that's awesome. And someday as parents, that's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to a time where we welcome them into the extended family. Where we welcome them into a relationship with God along with us. 
And how joyful are we going to be in those moments? Remember there in Luke 15, Luke 15, how the father welcomed his child back home, how joyful he was, how they killed the fattened calf, how they had a great celebration. You know, imagine that day, Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, when he was confronted by his mother and, and, brothers, and brothers coming to, to meet him. And the crowds were surrounding him, and they, they had to come tell Jesus, oh, you're your, your family's here. And what did Jesus say? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. What a thing to say, Jesus. What a thing to say. And you might say, oh, well, that was very disrespectful toward Mary and toward his brothers. Well, no, it wasn't. Jesus obviously respected his, his mother. He respected his brothers. But what he's saying is, here is the level above that. Here's the level above that. I view anyone who follows me, anyone who is obedient, who does the will of my father, I view anyone who does that as my family. And that's what we ought to be looking forward to. That ought to be that that great joyful moment where we welcome our kids into the extended family of the Lord. And it's okay to let them know how excited we're going to be someday about that. Not that we're pushing them, not that we're forcing them, not that we want them to just make a decision based on us and based on our belief. We want them to make their own decision. But when they do, it's party time. <laughs> it really is. It's a, it's a joyful time to know that that is what we're looking forward to. And, okay, maybe on, the, maybe on the negative side. We need to constantly be reinforcing that there are some serious consequences of not making the right decision. There are some serious consequences in play if they are not going to make the right call. And we've talked about it there from the vine, but in, in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 through 37, Jesus says, For what is a profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. For what can a man give in return for his soul? Our little ones need to know that if they don't have a relationship with God, they've lost it all. And that is a hard thing to, to tell someone. I know we've not had to do that with, with Ashlyn or anyone else in our sort of immediate family, but extended family. I mean, there have been plenty of people, plenty of brothers and cousins and other people who we have had to say these hard words. You've, you've lost it all. There's nothing that you have found in this life that is worth more than giving your life to the Lord. And it's hard to watch somebody have that prodigal moment. It's, it's hard to watch somebody go in that direction. But if they should come to their senses someday, and our prayer constantly is that they would, then they need to know that we're going to rejoice with them when they come back. The angels in heaven, in fact, will rejoice, as, as Luke 15 talks about. It is going to be a celebration when they return. And so that's the end game. That's the goal, is to watch our little ones finally, someday, give their life to the Lord. And if we keep that in mind, I think it helps us elevate above all of the trivial things in life, all the little, the little distractions that Satan is going to constantly throw our way. And so we think about our guidance throughout our kids' lives. We think about the way that we can provide them with a lasting direction as they go out and, and how we celebrate with them when they give themselves to the Lord. And so are your kids going to be people that you enjoy being around? This is, a, this is an important thing for us to remember that, you know, our kids are, are going to be our kids always. They'll always be our kids. But are, are they going to be people that we like? Are they going to be people that we enjoy being around? And again, that's not really within your control because they're going to make their own choices. But hopefully, prayerfully, the Lord will guide them into a life that is one in Christ, that is united in the Lord Jesus. And if they are, then I think our kids will be people who we can enjoy being around and celebrate with them. So that's the end of this series, sending out our kids, sending them out into the world and 
it's a, it's a responsibility that we all have. And again, you might be thinking, oh, well, these last handful of lessons haven't really helped me. I'm not a parent. I don't have kids. Well, you have influence over kids' lives here. There are kids here. Even if you are never a parent, if, even if you've never actually raised a kid, you have an opportunity to positively influence young people here. So we all have a role. We all have a responsibility. And hopefully someday we can send out our kids into the world and let them take on the mantle, pass the baton to them to where they can begin to serve the Lord for themselves. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Please check out your songbooks. If you're not a child of the Lord, if you haven't given your life to him, there is no better time than today to commit yourself to him. There's no better time than right now for you to connect yourself to the vine. If we can pray for you, we can baptize you, whatever your spiritual needs are this morning. Please come as we stand and sing.